All right. So if I used only uh, co copyright free or Creative Commons open sources, I'm going to be more severely limited. But that also means that I don't need to do a very good job transforming those images, right? So I could take all cartoons from here. But even if I take them from Google Images, even though all of these are individually copyrighted, as long as I can fully transform them into my own image, and that's the goal, if we look back at those past student examples, that's the goal, to make your own thing out of them, then we are not creating derivative artworks anymore. We are making something original. And that can only really be determined by a jury. <laughs> you know? And the reason Disney uh, is so litigious about its usage rights, like if I tried to publish this on a t-shirt, I'm guessing Disney would sue. Be because you can tell that it's Mickey Mouse. But this one, for instance, I can't tell at all where those references came from. So that's a, a, a truly non-derivative work. That one's a little bit more derivative. That one's less so, you know, on and on. So it's something we're going to play with. Again, Arturo Herrera is my guide for this. How to not get sued by Disney. Okay, so now I can actually minimize Chrome because I don't need any more references than what I found but I can always go back to my image search if I decide I want something more. You can have more than five, but you need a minimum of five. I'm going to take my favorite image of these five, and this is a tool we're gonna to use a lot on the Mac operating system. So our folder of references, I wanna see those references larger. So I'm gonna to go to the folder options under the settings wheel, and I'm going to say show view options. And then under the view options, I'm going to make my icon size nice and big. And I'm going to make my grid spacing nice and tight. So I can see them all at once. I'm not going to make that my default, but I'm going to use that for this folder. And then I'm going to arrange them by name just so they all show. Right? And that way, without having to open them in any program, this is just looking at the folder. I can see them clearly, and this is my favorite by far. That's already almost a cartoon jumble. So I'm going to right click on that, and I'm going to say open with Photoshop. So that's one way to open an image file in Photoshop. Another way is to just click on the image and drag it down to the Photoshop icon in your dock. So whatever way you like, but the problem with the dragging technique is you can slip. <laughs> So I always just right click and say open with this program. So now we're in Photoshop for the first time this semester. And it's similar to Pixlr that we were playing with before, the free online browser-based version. It shows me um, the memory that this image takes in the bottom left-hand corner. And so even though this is just a flat black and white image, it's already taking 14 megabytes of memory. And that's because its image size is so large. So if I go to image, image size, I can actually see what its image size is. And remember, our parameters were it had to be at least 4 megapixels. And 4 megapixels is basically exactly what this is. So 4 megapixels means it prints roughly on an 8x10 image, or I think of within an 8x10 map, like a large photo, um, at a high enough resolution for printing. The printing standard professionally is 300 pixels per inch, and that's what this is, at 6 inches by 8.5 inches. Our lab standard is going to be higher. For Studio 205, we want to always create work that's 350 pixels per inch, but we'll get there. Okay, so I'm going to say, I'm not going to change anything in the image size, I was just checking it. But now I'm going to create a canvas, a piece of paper that's at the resolution and the size I want. So I go to image, canvas size, and I'm going to make this eight inches wide, 10 inches tall,
and say OK. And you see how that built around my image. Then I'm going to go to image size, and I am going to change the resolution. In order to do that, without changing the height and the width, I have to have this resample checkbox checked. And this actually means that the computer is going to make up information, which is not in general a good thing. It does soften the image a little bit. But because I'm going to be distorting these cartoon jumbles anyway, I'm going to be resizing them. This gives me the parameters I want. All right. Now I have my base image. You'll notice because I added white on the projector, it's harder to see this than on my screen. But I can see that this image isn't purely black and white. So what's something I can do? I can go to Image, Adjustments, Levels, just like we did in Pixlr. And I can optimize the white so that it's truly white, the white of the paper. I can even darken the blacks. But I kind of like the graininess, so I'm not going to. But I want that white to be white. You can kind of see the difference on the projector. You can definitely see it on my screen. All right. Now, I'm not going to change this one at all. This is my favorite one. I'm going to leave it as my base for now. I'll show you how we can change it later. Now I'm going to shrink my Photoshop to about two-thirds of my screen so I can also see my references. And I'm going to drag and drop my references on to my new Photoshop file. So my next favorite is this one. Drag and drop it on. It's going to come in as what's called a smart object. What a smart object is in Photoshop is that it references an outside file. So you know it's a smart object when it has this X across its box. While it has the X across the box, already you can resize it. It's a free transform box. You can rotate it. You can flip it. You can do all kinds of things. And honestly, you might as well. Because by being a smart object, whatever settings you choose, it is going to go to the reference file, whatever the original resolution was, and it's going to optimize it to be as good as it can be to the parameters you're setting. So then you hit return. Okay? Now the problem is, this is not white. It's a gray. You can see that on the projector. And if I go to image adjustments, levels, to brighten it, I can do that. But it will be different. So what's the difference between these two, fold, these two layers? One is just a normal layer. It says background. But this one now has a little icon in the window because it's a smart layer. That's how you know it's a smart layer. And instead of actually just brightening it and doing a direct adjustment, it did it as a smart filter, which is something new to Photoshop. And all of that's just too confusing. So once you've brought in your object, then you're going to right click on the layer and you're going to do what's called rasterize it, which means don't link it to an external image source anymore. Instead, just save it as pixel memory within Photoshop. That's what rasterizing means. So when I do that, it becomes a regular layer. That little icon goes away. And then when I do image adjustment levels to brighten it up, it's perfectly clean. And it doesn't make the layer have all these complicated properties that can be a um, difficult layer later on. Okay, the other problem is, notice how all the whites of that image are overlapping with my image underneath, right? How do I fix that? Well, just like in Pixlr, we're going to play with the blending mode. And so in the layer window here, I'm going to change it from normal to multiply. And that will make all the whites transparent. It will only let the darker pixels come through. And then if I want to change and mess around with it, I can do um, Edit, Free Transform, just like in Pixlr. The shortcut for that is Command-T in Photoshop. And now that I can see through it, I can rotate it. You know, I can move it and shape it the way I want. But now I only have two images, so let's bring in some more. 
So this one I like, but it has stuff I need to erase. So let's bring it on. Let's rasterize it. Well, let's move it a little bit. I'll flip it. Just to remind me that the text is not something I'm married to. Feel free to distort it any way you like. So I'm not trying to keep the original aspect ratio. If I was, I'd be holding down shift. Okay, then I hit return to place it. Then I right click on the layer to rasterize it. And now I'll go to image adjustment levels. I would suggest you do this as well because not everything you find online is black line work is really clean black line work. And optimize it. Brighten the whites. You can also darken the darks. I'm going to set it to multiply mode. But now I have stuff to erase. So I'm going to turn off my other layers just so I can see this layer clearly. And you turn it off in Photoshop by turning off the eyeball. Then I'm going to use my lasso tool. And I'm simply going to loop around the stuff I want to get rid of and hit delete. I'm going to be pretty um, aggressive with it. This is a project of editing. But I, I know I need to at least get rid of that stuff. And I'll probably get rid of more in the middle here. Okay, but so far so good. Now I just need to bring two more references on. This one, good. Hit return to place it. Right click on the layer to rasterize it. Then I am able to go to image adjustment, play with the levels. We're just doing black and white. We'll add color next, next lesson. Optimize the whites. I can hit command T or I can go up to edit free transform to rotate it. Remember, I, I think these are most successful when they don't have a, a defined up or down, when they're kind of composed from all angles. And then I'm going to change its blending mode to multiply. And then I can use the move tool and kind of see what that layer is, right? And kind of place it just right. Last one, it has some stuff I need to erase for sure. Hit return to place it, right click, rasterize the layer. Image, Adjustment, Levels, brighten it up. I'm not rotating them now or changing their size until I make them kind of more transparent because now it really depends how they work with the other elements. Um, use the lasso to circle the things I want to delete. Hit Delete. Hit Command D or click somewhere else to deselect and then change it to Multiply Mode. And then Command T or Edit Free Transform to play with its size and shape. And I like this just because it's a nice solid black somewhere. And I like that, that energy of his hair. All right. So now this is filling the space nicely. I might even decide I need a little bit more white space around it. So I'm going to go to Image Canvas Size. And now I'm going to make it even larger, 9 by 12. I need your project to be at least 8 by 10, but it can always be larger as long as it's still 350 pixels per inch. And I'm going to grow it from all sides. Now, what's interesting is when you do that, the stuff you deleted that was off of the border is still there. right? So now I'll go through and I'll make sure that stuff I need to delete, there we go, it's all in this layer is deleted fully. And then I can just cycle through my layers and see what they're doing. So this is the only layer I didn't modify. Right? It's what I'm building on top of. So what I can do is I can start modifying on top of that layer by erasing. So I want to set my defaults to my colors to default black on white. Use the eraser on the background level. You're allowed to erase. You can use a brush if you like. You can even use your stylus. Or you can just, this is what I'm going to recommend, you just use your lasso and I just select around things and fill them with white on the background layer. And if I don't even want to bother with that, 
um, I'll 